uh, so um, it's nice to have you all. Um, in, unless Sarah has some technical stuff to tell us about, we'll move on. Sure, I'd just like to say hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, if you aren't speaking at any given time, um, it would be helpful if you could mute um, your microphones just so we don't hear shuffling in the background. And we'll be going back and forth for a while with questions and discussions. Um, so there should be a little hand raise feature at the bottom of your screen or maybe at the top if you're using an iPad. Or if you can't find that, just, just wave. We can see everybody. <laughs> Great. So with that, I'll turn it on Pagliusha. Go ahead, okay. Joan. OK, so welcome, everyone. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our, our author tonight on Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, uh, Ted Widmer. He is an American history writer, librarian, as well as a former speech writer for President Clinton. He's a distinguished lecturer at Macaulay Honors College. Besides teaching, he writes about American history in the New York Times, the New Yorker, as well as the Washington Post. He's also taught at Harvard University, Brown University, and Washington College. So on Lincoln's 13th day journey to Washington, D.C. in February of 1861, the train ride, the journey, covered close to 2,000 miles, over 18 different railroad lines through 18 states, with over 100 speeches. So, Ted, my first question to you. How did you find out about the train ride? And maybe kind of tell us what did you find to be the most interesting and maybe the craziest part of the journey? Well, I found out about the train ride from a, a project that started in the New York Times around 2010 and went for five years called Disunion. And it was in the online part of the New York Times and a bunch of younger Civil War historians were trying to write in an, in an immediate way, in a way that would be interesting to general readers about the events 150 years earlier. And we started in the fall of 2010 on the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's election in 1860. And for a while, I was sort of fo following everything that Lincoln did but 150 years earlier. And as we got into February of 2011, I began to realize he has this very long train trip. And I read a bit about it. There were some places to read about it, but not, not very many. And as I read, I thought this is a tremendous story combining travel and a chance to see America through his eyes, but also a chance to look at him under pretty stressful circumstances as he's dealing with danger from huge crowds who like him too much, and then also danger from people who are trying to kill him on his way into Washington. So I just thought this is almost like a thriller, and I can't believe no one has written a book like this. So I just started to really research it a lot and read the old newspapers in, from every city that he went through and put together a, a book proposal and it, it was accepted. And then I was off to the races and, and running. Nice. <clears throat> um, the telegraph and the railroad seem to be, to put it as the locomotion, sort of the, the two aspects of his journey. In the North and the South, um, did they treat those two locomotives differently with, with how they came about? Y yes, that was a big part of one chapter, my third chapter, is all about how amazing the railroad was when it came in and also how disruptive it was because it came in in different ways in different parts of the country. And the North and the Midwest just loved the train. And it wasn't just that it brought so many new families out to the Midwest, but it enriched a lot of people who invested in the in the railroad and it it um, deepened the connection between the upper Midwest and New York and New England and it really built a new economy the, a whole economy that 
revolved around rapidly sending goods and, and also information. Newspapers traveled on trains and tele, telegraph wires were strung above train tracks. So there's a, a kind of new economic and information world in New England, New York, Pennsylvania, the Midwest. And the South doesn't have that at all. It does have trains, but they don't embrace them nearly with the same enthusiasm. They're not built as well. They um, don't carry as many people. Um, they have to go longer distances. It's farther between Southern cities generally than between Northern cities. And they begin to develop a kind of suspicion of the railroad including for a political reason, which is that trains are bringing so many immigrants into states like Illinois and Wisconsin, Minnesota and Iowa, that the North's gaining a lot of political power as, as they figure out with every census. And 1860 is a census year. And one of the reasons I think that the South secedes is not only that Lincoln has been elected, but they just realize they're losing power every 10 years and they they feel like this is the last chance they have to hold on to what they've got, including slavery. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Ohio River and, and what it meant to Abraham Lincoln? I'm so glad you asked because, I mean, in, in this book, I spent a lot of time looking at maps. I, I really focused on every city that he went through. Each major city is a chapter unto itself, but I, I kept seeing this um, extremely winding river. It's a huge river that goes from Pittsburgh to where it finds the Mississippi River in Cairo, Illinois. And I just thought this is a big part of the story I'm trying to tell. Uh, Lincoln grows up on both sides of the Ohio. He's born in Kentucky on the Southern side, which is, you know, on the slavery side. And then his father moves into Southern Indiana where he really grows up, and, but he's always near the Ohio. It's a place for him of um, excitement, adventure, a little bit of employment. He's a, as a teenager, he is a kind of ferry boat operator and he's, he, then goes down the Mississippi, down the Ohio and the Mississippi with a friend to New Orleans. And he didn't go to high school or college, but in a way the Ohio River was his education. And I think much more than the Mason-Dixon line, which we think of as the boundary between North and South, the Ohio is a longer and more interesting boundary. The Mason-Dixon is just between Pennsylvania and Maryland. It's, I mean, it's okay. But the Ohio River really goes a long way and a lot of things happen on both sides of the Ohio River, including Aaron Burr's cons conspiracy, um, De Tocqueville travels up and down the Ohio and Lincoln really is getting formed. And by getting formed, I mean, he's, he's aware of the differences. He, he knows both sides. And so he's growing up with an incredibly close, seat to the difference between slavery and, and freedom because he's living right at the, the edge of the two societies. At one time, wasn't he attacked at some point on, on his journey? Yes. Um, he went twice to New Orleans and on one of the trips, he was he and his friend were attacked by a group of, um, they were probably escaping slaves who were living near the river and were just desperate basically but they came on and tried to steal the boat that Lincoln was piloting toward New Orleans and Lincoln fought them off but got a scar uh, under under his eye which I've tried to see in photographs and I can't really see but it was a you know, pretty traumatic episode. Sure. So he's anti-slavery but he also um, in, encounters violence from from recently escaped slaves on, on one of those New Orleans trips. All of the wonderful cities that you mentioned in the book, does one, um, when you were doing your research, does one stand out from the others as to what really, you know, took your interest away from the others? Well, I, 
I loved all of them. I don't want to dodge your question, but for me, one of the joys of this book was understanding how exotic our own cities are. Mm -hmm. Cities like Cincinnati and Pittsburgh are, are really interesting. Cleveland and Buffalo, they all have their own identities. They have different economic uh, pursuits. Pittsburgh is beginning to discover petroleum. I didn't even know that our, our fossil fuels extraction begins in Northwestern Pennsylvania, but it, it did. Cincinnati is very good at um, meat slaughtering and meat preservation for all those frontier families going out, out West. They needed to eat, of, of course. Um, Buffalo is at the western edge of the Erie Canal and is specializing in helping all, all kinds of products to give families that are moving further further west. But New York is so much bigger than any other city that it's endlessly fascinating to me. It's got um, more than a million people in 1860, if you count Brooklyn and Manhattan. And it's just an overwhelming city beginning to approach the size of London and, and Paris. And that's strange for Americans because they still think we are a nation of sort of small farmers or people who live in small towns. And New York isn't that at all. New York is a, a new reality that's very, very different. Mm. Um, there were a lot of different things happening along the journey. He wasn't always perfect. You know, he had his his clunker speeches and he had some missteps and he had some some very emotional moments. Can you um, kind of enlighten us on some of those that maybe stand out to you the most? Sure, he, he was in formation, I guess is how I would say it. I mean, he, he'd been elected president, so he's doing pretty well, but he hadn't really spoken in this way to the uh, the entire American people. He was well known in Illinois. He'd done the debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858, but he hadn't seen this many people in different cities and states. So he, he was sort of figuring out how to, how to talk to them. And there were some bad days as well as good days. And on the first night of the trip, he's in Indianapolis. And well, every day, this was one of the things that was so interesting to me. He wrote out a formal speech for every day of the trip, hoping that he would only have to give one speech. But the reality of the trip was he had to give many every day because he was in such demand. So he would give his written out speech, but then people would keep asking him to speak. And then things got a little dicey because he didn't have any paper in front of him and in Indianapolis he told a joke that was sort of off color, which is a little bit shocking when we think of Abraham Lincoln, who's a very moralistic person, but he was in front of a crowd and he was complaining about how the South thought about the Union and how they understood it to be a kind of free love arrangement instead of a sacred contract like a marriage. And he got a huge laugh from the crowd who thought it was hilarious, funny. But he's basically telling a quasi-sexual anecdote um, in, a, in a very delicate moment in American history. And I mean, the papers tore him apart, especially the Southern papers, just uh, how could we be sending into the White House someone this barbaric? So Lincoln is improvising and it doesn't always work, but later in the trip, he improvises beautifully. He gets better and better and starts talking about American history and what it means to him. And on the last, the last day of the trip before his all night secret trip into Washington, he goes into Independence Hall in Philadelphia and talks about the declaration. And that's incredibly beautiful and shows how far he has come in a week of traveling. He's much more sophisticated about speaking and he's also foreshadowing the, the Gettysburg Address. The, the, the words he uses in Philadelphia in 1861 are, are not that far away from the, the ones he uses at Gettysburg in 1863. And his son carried that speech from the very beginning, right? 
Well, that's one of my favorite stories is this, his son, Robert, who's a college freshman and is having the time of his life. He's out every night and there's a fair amount of evidence he's drinking a lot every every night. I mean, he's about 18 years old and he's the son of the president elect and he's he's enjoying himself. And in one city that was probably Indianapolis, his father gave him an incredibly important satchel. It's like a briefcase. And it held Lincoln's only copy of the inaugural address, which he was still working on. And he just gave it to Robert and said, take care of it. And Robert went downstairs and put it in the baggage storage area of the hotel and then went into the bar and forgot about it for hours. And Lincoln asked Robert later when he came up, what'd you do with my briefcase? And Robert said, oh, I just gave it to the hotel. And a look of horror came over Lincoln's face and he ran downstairs and ran over the uh, counter where the, the baggage area was behind a counter and Link, Lincoln leapt it like an Olympic hurdler <laughs> and went in and started going through. And there were about 25 black briefcases that all looked exactly the same. And he started opening all of them and finally yeah. found, found his speech. It was still there. Wow, incredible. Um, how about the women in his life? Um, do you have any really good stories about Mary Todd or Dorothea Dix and, and Kate Warren, right? Is that her, is that how you pronounce her name, Warren no, or is it Warna? Don't know. I, I often say Warney, but it could be Warren. I'm not. Okay. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure either. Um, well, Mary presented a problem for me because there weren't, there was nothing in her own words written down. And there wasn't that much about her on the train, except a few sort of descriptions of how she looked in, in newspaper articles. I found one account that was very entertaining, if it's true, but also a little bit disturbing, which is on the very first morning of the trip, they're about to go from their hotel to the train and she lay on the ground and refused to get up and left, unless he appointed one of her friends to an office. In, in, <laughs> in the White House, um, which is a pretty negative story about her. But then later in the trip, there was a beautiful moment, I thought, where she's he's on his way into New York City and she combs his hair and makes him look better just before he goes out to talk to the crowd. So obviously they're, they're very close also. I, I mean, it's they have moments of fighting, but they also love each other. Um, the other women you mentioned are, are very important to the book. And I was really happy to find them because most Civil War history is pretty male. But in, in this case, two women play an incredibly important role in saving Lincoln's life. There's a woman, a Massachusetts woman named Dorothea Dix, who is a mental health advocate. She's made her reputation going around the country, helping states build mental hospitals and figuring out humane ways of taking care of the mentally ill. And while she's traveling through the South in the fall of 1860, she hears all these rumors that Southerners are planning to kill Lincoln before he can make it to Washington. And probably it will happen along the train route between Philadelphia, Baltimore, and, and Washington. So she goes to, she finds the head of that railroad who's also from Massachusetts. His name is Samuel Felton. And he's from West Newbury, Massachusetts. And he designed a railroad in Massachusetts that is still very much in use. And that is the Fitchburg line of the MBTA. The train that goes now to uh, Wachusett is the last stop, but not too far from Lexington. And it goes adjacent to Walden Pond in, in Concord. So he builds that railroad line and then he keeps advancing in his career and he becomes the head of a big railroad in the mid-Atlantic, the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore. And Dorothea Dix comes and says to him, you've got to save Lincoln's life. They're going to try to kill him uh, on, when he's on, on your train into Washington. So he hires some detectives, including Alan Pinkerton, who's somewhat well known for later 
helping to start the U.S. Secret Service. And Pinkerton brings a female spy with him named Kate Warren or Kate Warney, who impersonates a Southern woman in Baltimore and gets all the information about the assassination plot out, out of her friends she makes with her Southern accent. And they get the information to Lincoln. And uh, on the last day of his trip, he takes a an all-night train hidden in a compartment in the back of the train and sneaks into Washington as the president-elect. Wow. Um, do you think that had he not made it to Washington, do you think that it would have changed the country's history? I do. Yes. And I think it was a very close call. We, we know that he won the, the Civil War. He kept the country together. But it was very touch and go in those early weeks, the weeks before he becomes president, and then even the weeks after. And there are a lot of angry people walking around Washington. It's a southern city. It's much more of a southern city than a northern city. And they don't like the fact that a, a somewhat anti-slavery president has come in. And in those early weeks, Lincoln really had to kind of um, minimize just how anti-slavery he was just to keep the government functioning. And if he hadn't made it, either because he was killed or because they just sort of stopped the train and wouldn't let him make it to Washington, he probably would have had to start a government in Philadelphia. And it would have been that much harder, I think, to keep the country together if if the former capital of the United States was not in control of the United States, I just think it would have been hard to keep the two different sections um, to, to reunite them ever. I mean, it was hard enough as it was even when he made it to Washington, but if he couldn't get to the White House and the Capitol and the symbolism of those very important buildings, I think it would have been hard for him to argue that we are one country. And Jefferson Davis was right there on his on his heels, ready to take over. Absolutely. Davis is a little ahead of Lincoln in his, his own schedule. He is sworn in as president of the Confederate States on February 18th, and Lincoln's still on the train to Washington. So they have started the Confederate States of America before Lincoln can get to Washington and start his government. So Lincoln is behind schedule. Mm. What do you think Lincoln's message would be to our current Congress if he was to speak to them today? Well, I think he would tell everyone that our, our differences are not as important as the things that unite us. And he would urge a kind of patriotism that isn't just, you know, all one way or all the other, but a kind of collective patriotism about a great and diverse people who've been through a lot of struggles earlier in, in their history, who are losing their influence in the world because they are bickering so much and show some signs of um, anti-democratic behavior over the, the last few years. The the organization that measures the quality of democracy around the world, Freedom House, um, has begun to call the United States um, an endangered democracy because voting is becoming much more difficult. And a lot of campaign cash is, is also sort of undermining the, the, the way we expect to have a direct experience of, a, of our politics and, and of course just the incredible bitterness with which both parties attack each other but one party a little more I would say is a little more toxic and a little more anti-democratic and and Lincoln would say you, you have to let people vote I mean the American people are the final arbiters of their own democracy and if you're not if you're not letting them vote it's not a very impressive democracy. Mm. So before I turn the, the, the questions over to, to the group, um, I have 
one last sort of a, a statement from a critic that kind of sums up um, the title of your book. Um, a critic wrote, this journey was a very important but underappreciated episode that placed Lincoln on the verge of developing the confidence and courage to become America's greatest president. Uh, where do you rank him, Ted, amongst all of the, the greats that have come after him? Oh, he's always going to be number one for me without too much doubt about it. Um, he had the biggest problem to solve. So he had the highest degree of difficulty. The other two who are usually talked about in the top three are George Washington and uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And they, they had serious problems. They were very different. Washington just had to show that someone could actually do this job. That's so hard. And to keep an early system of parties from splintering apart. And with his prestige, he did that very, very well. But the country was a lot smaller and it wasn't being invaded by anyone when he was president. And Franklin Roosevelt was a very great president in many, many ways. Um, and he led us to victory in World War II. But as bad as that crisis was, it was not as bad a crisis as Americans at war with each other. And there wasn't a very good army that, for Lincoln to, to use to defend himself. And actually one thing I, I didn't want to forget to say to a Lexington audience is Massachusetts troops were incredibly important in these dangerous early weeks of the Lincoln presidency when anything might happen. And I mean, if the South had been a little better organized, they could have just sent a few hundred troops in. Virginia was still in the US, but it was full of people who didn't like Lincoln. And it was not at all certain Lincoln could stay in the White House in the early weeks, but a group of soldiers from Massachusetts came down and were uh, among the first to get there and to defend Washington. And as they came through Baltimore, just like Lincoln had, they, they encountered a lot of trouble. And a number, I think four or five, were killed just going through Baltimore on the way to Washington to defend Washington. And the day of that riot in 1861 was April 19th. So the same day as the, the first day of the American Revolution on Lexington Green. It's kind of an incredible coincidence. Wow. Uh, I'd also like to say before I open up questions and comments to the group that Ted has provided a wonderful series of photographs and um, Sarah, will we, we be able to share those with the group um, through uh, emails or some way? Sean, you're jinxing me. <laughs> the phone is ringing now. Um, <laughs> um, yes, if Ted's okay with that. <laughs> Sure, yep. That's great. So, and um, so as we are uh, going through here, feel free to, um, you know, ask questions of Ted, ask questions of each other, comments, we can bounce back and forth. Um, and Ted, if at any point you think that there's something um, that someone has brought up that deserves an illustration, I'm happy to share it on the screen. Okay. Okay. Questions, comments group, come forth. Done into silence. No questions? Come on. I guess we've covered everything then. Uh, your questions <laughs> were extremely good, Joan. I could tell you'd read it very oh, carefully. Thank terrible. you. I enjoyed your book tremendously. I was very surprised that I had no idea that his assassination attempts had started way before um, he, yeah. he got into office. That was a real eye opener for me. Yeah, I had that no was idea big part of the drama of the book and of course he makes it but it, it I, I really was amazed at how close he came to to not making it and think as your question suggested just think how different our entire history would have been if he had not made it on that train in, into Washington 
Do you think that if he was up for nomination in any other time period, do you think he would have made the nomination at any other point in, in time? Uh, no, I don't. He was a very distant long shot at the beginning of 1860. He, he was not very well known. He's a regional politician in Illinois who lost a Senate race two years earlier and had only one two-year term as a congressman 12 years earlier. So he, his experience was not very impressive, but everything opened perfectly for him. The, the Democratic Party, which usually won, it was a stronger party, split in half. So there was a Northern wing and a Southern wing of the Democratic Party. So they, they sort of canceled each other out. And then within the Republican Party, there were more famous politicians. There were a few senators who wanted it. And the one who was most likely to get it was New York Senator William Seward. But he was in, he, he just wasn't the flavor of the month in 1860. And one reason was his, he was honest, but the New York State Party of the Republican Party was somewhat corrupt the way New York politics is usually somewhat corrupt. And everyone, the, the Republican party had a lot of strength in the Midwest and they felt strongly that they wanted a new kind of beginning. They wanted a new type of politician and they didn't want someone who was sort of tainted by earlier political uh, affiliations with corrupt state bosses. So Lincoln is just, he survives the first round of voting and the second, and he starts to get stronger. And by the third round, there's a rush to support him as a, the, the new kind of man. And the slogan of the rail splitter was perfect. Americans wanted someone who was sort of down to earth, not a stuffed shirt politician. Lincoln had been a rail splitter, but uh, 30 years earlier, he was actually a lawyer who, you know, wore a coat and tie every day. But it was very useful to describe him as the rail splitter. So he just caught the moment perfectly. Mm. And I, I love the one term that I, I keep, I kept reading in the book, reading in the book was his moral compass. I think that was such a great attribute to this man, always his moral compass. Yes, it was so important and, and it helped him in, in so many ways. I mean, the way he was anti-slavery was important and he was the most anti-slavery person who had ever been elected, but he also knew how to talk to people who were not sure how they felt on that issue yet. It was a very different country then than it is now, uh, obviously. And he was good at speaking to the entire country, in, including people who were not exactly anti-slavery, but didn't want slavery to continue to be as strong as it was sort of controlling everything in, in Washington. He just had a good way of relating to a lot of different kinds of Americans. And I think that made him a good president. Mm, very good. Sue, Linda. Oh, sorry. Good evening. Hello. Um, to me, uh, one of Lincoln's finest attributes was something so simple and that was patience yes he knew enough not to hurry he just knew that this train trip presented an opportunity he could have rushed to washington and got there a heck of a lot faster right but he understood that if he took his time he could really benefit in many ways. So he, I, I believe the book said he gave a hundred speeches. A hundred speeches is a heck of a lot of speeches, yeah. but they were halting at first. By the time he arrived in Washington, they were superbly polished. He was one heck of a speech maker oh, by right. that time. And he deliberately made sure that he visited every state he won in the election because he wanted to cement that win, let people get a look at him, see him, make a lot of friends for the future and so on. And he just got so much good 
out of the trip for himself. He got to know his constituency. They got to know him. So much benefits. And he, he must have restrained himself countless times to just get the heck to Washington. But um, he knew better. And he said, no, we're going to do it this way. Right. And, uh, you know, that was just an it worked out well. <laughs> Admirable quality. That's a very. He had to have. He had to have my home state of Kentucky. Well, he didn't go on the train through Kentucky. He looked at Kentucky. He looked across the Ohio River from Cincinnati at mm -hmm. Kentucky, and he even spoke to Kentuckians. They were in the, in the crowd in Cincinnati, but he also sort of spoke as if they could hear him on the other side of the river, and he cared a lot about Kentucky. I mean, he was a, he, a native Kentuckian also, but he couldn't take the train through Kentucky. Yeah. Sue? Sue, you're muted. Yeah. There you go. I got it. Um, I, I was just wondering, you mentioned that you had provided some, some pictures, and I wondered if it would be useful to share those and have your comments on them. Um, I don't mind if, if the group is agreeable. Sure. Sure, let me just bring it up one moment. So this is um, an overhead view of Boston from 1860. So it's the year Lincoln is elected. I just thought it was interesting to see Boston as, his, as Lincoln's period is beginning. Wow. And Lincoln did not, he was not very well known in Boston. Um, Boston was still, and if you go to the next slide, it was still kind of obsessed by Daniel Webster. This is Webster's funeral at the State House, Boston. And sorry, was there a question? No, okay. So Lincoln is, is not a part of this old Bostonian world at all. He's a real new force in American politics. And if we keep going. So this is his inauguration. You can see a lot of people at the Capitol. You can't see him, but he's there. And um, you see the Capitol Dome is not yet finished. And that accurately conveyed the feeling of a country that isn't finished, that is in fact falling apart at this very moment with seven states have decided they don't want to be in the country anymore. So Lincoln's got to give a speech to half a country, but pretending that the whole country is still together. Is that just a, a strange shadow on there or was there a fire at some point during this construction process? I think that is a shadow. Good okay. question, Sarah. But And here's his speech. I mentioned his inaugural address. Um, this is what it looks like. It's in the Library of Congress and you can see a lot of frantic writing at the end, still adding new thoughts. And the, the most famous passage is the very end about the better, better angels of our nature. And you can see that handwritten at the bottom. So a lot of things were coming together, even as he's beginning his presidency, including his speech. Um, okay. So this is a year earlier. This is a very young looking Abraham Lincoln on um, uh, two days after he won the nomination for president. This is a photograph in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The picture is off the screen and it is to the right. <laughs> I can try minimizing the um, PowerPoint. It might look a bit clunky, but let's see. Boy, so did he, he age in five years. He sure did, yeah. yeah. He's only That's great. here. Thank you. What always impresses me is that uh, Abraham Lincoln has a different haircut in every single picture yeah. I've ever seen. <laughs> I didn't realize he had so much hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a really great one. I don't know if you all have seen it. I think it was when they were doing... Um, one of the life masks and they put some kind of gel in his hair and it's sticking straight up. Yeah. Of the punk rocker from the 80s. It's hilarious. <laughs> so 
even if Lincoln's not from Massachusetts, his ancestors were. So this is an old church, the old ship church in um, Hingham. Oh. And one of Lincoln's ancestors was an immigrant from England to Hingham and helped to build this building. The next slide, I think, shows a plaque that says that. I've been there. Yeah. So you see uh, at the bottom, it says Samuel Lincoln, original American ancestor of Abraham Lincoln, worshipped here regularly. Um, okay. So there's Dorothea Dick. She's the woman who really saved his life. I think that's accurate to say. She's the one who told the head of the railroad, who's in the next slide. That's Samuel Felton. And then the next slide shows his train, I think, through going. That's Thoreau's drawing of Walden Pond. And at the upper right-hand corner, you see a, a okay. um, diagonal line. And that's the, the railroad that is now the Fitchburg line. <laughs> and here it is again. You, see, you know it better this way. But it's that horizontal line in the bottom. And this just shows how many railroads are in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut in 1860. The South isn't like this at all. The South has them, but not nearly as many. So it's a, a completely different economy in the North. And Lincoln is a part of this. Lincoln has been a railroad lawyer and he likes trains personally. So the, the subplot of the book of Lincoln being on a train felt to me appropriate. Mm. Here's the railroad that he's gonna have trouble on. This is the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore. And so you can see it goes a lot of creeks and there was a fear that they would plant explos explosives on, under train bridges. Was this the one where he had to transfer so many times or is that further that on? In Baltimore. In Baltimore. So, um, at the end of the line. <laughs> what are we listening to? Somebody's sneezing. Huh? <coughs> I come to you, dear. Okay, next one. No. no. So there's Pinkerton on the left. He's the detective who comes and protects Lincoln on the last day of the trip. <laughs> And they were later photographed together during the Civil War. Sorry, it's not a very good photo. And the next photo is Kate Warney, his female assistant, the spy who he recruited, who also guarded Lincoln in the last night of the trip. She rode with him in that, in that car. Very brave woman. Oh, I have seen a photograph with, I forget if it was actually... Lincoln, I think it was one of the other generals that claims that it might have been her. I don't uh -huh. know if you've seen it or if you can lend I any. I, this is the only one I know, so I, I don't know that other one. That's fascinating. <laughs> it, was, it was essentially, uh, I think, an unidentified, slightly feminine looking man that huh. people have said it could have been uh, huh. based on this one blurry <laughs> photograph. So this is a re production. I mean, it's, it's not a photograph, but it's, a, it's an artist version of his farewell speech to the town of Springfield, which is how he starts the train trip by saying goodbye to his fellow townspeople, whom he would never see alive again. They would never see him alive again. And a lot of speeches from the back of the train. Here's Cleveland it's a great image, but it's a little hard to see here. You just see a stick figure on a balcony under a big American flag speaking to a huge crowd. And he did that over and over again. So for most Americans, this was the only time they ever saw Abraham Lincoln was on this trip. Here he is in New York, uh, above the balcony of a hotel called the Astor House. Um, near City Hall and Lower Broadway in Manhattan. Another huge crowd was here for this, this speech. So I'm just sort of showing him in action a little bit. And the next slide shows him at the moment, uh, the young cartoonist Thomas Nast, 
um, saw him getting out of a train in New York City and, and quickly sketched him. And I found these two drawings. They were, they'd never been seen before. And I found them in the Brown University Library. That's cool. I've never seen them before either. And you know, he um, only started growing that beard in November after being elected. Um, this is the only photograph from the entire train trip, and it's him giving a speech at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. You can't really see him here, but in, in there are some books that blow up this photograph. You can see him a little better. It's kind of fuzzy, but he's above the flag, sort of above the stars in the flag. And here's where he gave a beautiful speech about what the Declaration of Independence meant, meant to him. So he's beginning to really find his voice by the end of the trip. Here's a map of Baltimore, and that's where he was in the most trouble. Baltimore had three train stations. As trains were coming into American cities, they often built two or three train stations near each other, but not one central station because the merchants liked it when people got off and then walked through downtown to the next station. They thought they could sell more goods that way. And... Lincoln was in a lot of danger in Baltimore because he would have to get off the train and ride a horse and carriage to the next station. It was probably there that they were gonna to try to surround him and kill him. And there's another major American city that failed to ever build a single downtown station. Do you know what city that is? Boston. Absolutely. <laughs> giant inconvenience to get off at South Station and get to North Station if you're yeah. going to Maine. Boston mm -hmm. never figured it out. <laughs> All these years. Yeah. So stupid. <laughs> these are a set of brass knuckles that Alan Pinkerton had that are now in the collection of Ford's Theater in Washington. And there he is the day after he arrived and he's looking very presidential and normal, but he'd really survived a pretty narrow brush with assassination. But this was to get the word out to the people of America that they had a new president and he was healthy and safe. Um, Matthew Brady took this photograph in Washington, but it's, it's a little bit of a deception because it was such a close call. And so here's that Massachusetts regiment coming through Baltimore on April 19th, 1861. And the crowd attacked them with guns and knives and, and throwing rocks. And the young soldiers fired back. They, there were deaths on both sides. Wow. Yeah, pretty serious episode. But thank God the Massachusetts troops made it to Washington because otherwise Lincoln might not have survived. Ooh. Ted, was there a reason why the Massachusetts Regiment was actually um, selected or why they were there? Was there a reason? I'm, I'm sure there's a good answer and I can't quite remember. I mean, Lincoln had put out the, warn the, the word to every Northern governor that I'm, I'm in a lot of trouble here. Can you send troops immediately? And somehow Massachusetts just was faster. They mm, okay. They it was a good Republican state. It voted for him. And also, I think, you know, there was a real feeling of, um, I mean, America was changing very rapidly at this moment from not wanting to, to cause trouble to, to, you know, wanting to just sort of get through the problems around the election of 1860 to then after the seven states had seceded, a lot of anger in the North and in Massachusetts and a feeling like they can't keep pushing us around. We are going to show them. So in, April, in March and April, it was changing and the North was getting angrier. And that really surprised the South because a lot of Southern leaders thought the North would just let them go. And the North mm -hmm. was getting angry. And this young man from uh, Lowell, 
Massachusetts was uh, among the, I think he was the first killed as those troops from Massachusetts came through, he was the first to fall. And so he's often considered the first casualty of the Civil War. And there's a little oh. statue, a little obelisk to him in downtown Lowell. Hmm. And I just ended with a few photographs of the Shaw Memorial on Boston Common on Beacon Street by the State House. Just a very beautiful sculpture by Augustus St. Gaudens, who also did a famous sculpture of, of Lincoln uh, as he saw him during the train trip, sort of standing on the back of, um, well, either a train platform or a stage. Yeah, there he is. Mm. That's in uh, Lincoln Park in Chicago, Illinois. And this is how Lincoln looked to a lot of Americans coming through as a reflective person, as, as someone was saying earlier in the call, he was patient. And, and not only was he deliberative and found the right words, there was a twinkle in his eye. He had a sense of humor. And he won over millions of Americans on this trip, which he needed to do because he was such an unknown quantity. And this is a, a view from Lincoln looking out at the famous march in 1963 that Martin Luther King spoke at. So he's just been a kind of conscience looking over our shoulders ever since. He, he saved our country when he was president, but he still speaks to us and urges us to be a little bigger toward each other, which we certainly, um, that's a lesson worth listening to now. Of course, our connection to the memorial is through Daniel Chester French. That's right. He was from Concord, Mass. Oh, the, I, I didn't know he was from there. Mm hmm. Bay Alcott was his art teacher. That's right. Oh. Great. So, I'm thank glad you. we did that. Great. That was fun. Yeah, thank you for that. That was great, idea. Ted. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that, that. This has been really great. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Or, Ted, is there anything more I can ask that you can tell us that maybe we didn't bring up? Yes, he has a question. There you go. Uh, do, are we off mute? Yeah. Uh, I, I learned so much um, information on your travel, on his travel through from Springfield to Washington. Uh, I'm wondering how you gathered the facts. Did you do the whole route? Did you go into city halls? Did you go um, to newspapers? A little bit, but I, I meant to do more of it. And I was going to have a kind of triumphant uh, tour of the route in 2020, but then COVID made it impossible. So I still <laughs> haven't done most of it. I've done a little, I did Springfield um, toward Indianapolis. I didn't make it all the way, um, but I still, you know, I want to go, um, I hope with my son, just take a couple weeks in a car and drive from Springfield toward New York, and it's kind of a winding route, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo, Albany, New York City, Trenton, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Washington. So it's, you know, a lot of driving, but I'd, I'd really like to do it. Um, a lot of my research was done online because you can read so many old newspapers online for free. So I was very grateful for that. The National Endowment for the Humanities paid for uh, something called Chronicling America, which is an amazing database of old newspapers. But I did a lot of old-fashioned slogging through libraries, too. Uh -huh. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, sorry. It's uh, yeah, Elizabeth hi. on the screen. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm using her phone. Okay. I'm using her laptop. Um, first of all, I was so uh, so enthralled with the, with the book. I couldn't believe how you uh, wove in so many different aspects of the common culture, um, you know, including people who are in the future going to in invent important um, right. uh, progress, if you will. Um, right. um, I was kind of um, surprised um, where the North was rather advanced with their industry that the South had a real hold on the government, um, you know, through the House of, um, you know, representatives and the, uh, the Senate. And, and I was just curious if you could expand on that. It, it seemed like uh, 
it was a huge uh, like grip on uh, on the government to keep enslaved uh, persons in that in that industry that they had going. Um, so it kind of surprised me where I thought the, the, where the North had been, um, you know, progressive. Why weren't they, you know, right. as involved? You know, right. Well, it's a kind of defect, I would argue, from the beginning of our history that the North agreed to a, a compromise with the South that included something temporary that the North wanted, which was um, the for Congress to pass an economic program that Alexander Hamilton wanted and gave up something permanent, which was the national capital would be in a, a very Southern place. It, it was quite Southern when it went there in 1800 and it's still a pretty Southern place. And it's, it's, um, it feels, I mean, there's a joke John F. Kennedy said, it's a city of Southern efficiency and Northern charm. Um, <laughs> and so they, the Southerners had just figured out our system of government better. And that's to their credit, they were really good political thinkers and they understood that having seniority in the House and Senate helped them. And they figured out how to control committees. And throughout the 19th century, most, I mean, until Lincoln, most presidents are either Southern or are pro-Southern Northerners. And they just have the system worked out. And so when Lincoln comes in, he's very threatening to them because they they have a sixth sense that he will reinvent the government, which he, he did. He not only won the Civil War, but he really changed the federal government and put lots of Northerners and Midwesterners into those jobs and built up new departments that hadn't been there before and really made the U.S. government something much bigger in people's lives than it ever had been. So it, it was a culture change when, when Lincoln came in, not just about slavery, but about a a lot of ideas about what the U.S. government should be. I was really touched how um, uh, Charles Adams and um, the brother, I forgot his name, sadly, I should know, Henry, mm -hmm. Henry Adams, uh, uh, Henry were so, in, okay, were so concerned as was, I believe, their grandfather, right? John Quincy Adams or yes. great grandfather? Um, that they were, they were very aware and trying to get the word out. And, and, and I was really surprised at how uh, Winifred, I believe it was, coming over um, to make sure the archives were protected while right. Lincoln's on his way to the Capitol. Right. Um, exactly. I mean, this force of people coming together dur during this, you know, troubling time was it was really um, a, a huge relief. And I know it was 100 years or plus years ago, but I was like, while I was reading, I was like, oh, thank good. Like it was, like it was happening now, you know. Well, I love the Adamses. I, I'm glad you noticed them. Uh, yeah. They're they're interesting, very talented young men. They're quite young. They're about 21 or two, but they're living in Washington and they write beautifully. But they they have a feeling their ancestors built a great country, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, and they're angry at the South for destroying it without even a moment's thought and for such a selfish reason as slavery. It's not a good enough reason to destroy a great country. So they're, they're part of this movement of rising anger in the North. And they don't think Lincoln's gonna be a very good president, but then over the years that follow, they, they see what he's made of and, and they are part of the total effort from the North and the Midwest and the West to keep this country together. They fought, Lincoln expressed a vision and he was able to persuade the entire country to believe in it, that the country was worth a horrible sacrifice, but it was worth it. And, and because of that, he's our, our greatest president, I think. I think so too, absolutely. I was, I was gonna ask, has anybody done anything equal to the Southern trip? of the... Uh, that's a good question. There is, Jefferson Davis is on a train going from Mississippi to Montgomery, Alabama, but it's a shorter train ride and the speeches he gave aren't 
we don't know what he said very well. They, they weren't re reported on as well in Southern newspapers. So Lincoln's in this information world where every word he says is, is written down by reporters and it's easy to find. And Jefferson Davis is in this sleepier part of the country where it's just harder to find out what he's saying or what other people, what he's doing at night. Um, I mean, I got a few details and I tried to put them in, but they weren't ne nearly as good as the ones I had for Lincoln. Yeah, thank you. I, I also wanted to hear, did anybody uh, contact you from the South who is a historian that uh, appreciated it or? Um, I just spoke to some people from Arkansas. Okay. Which is a, a pro-Southern state. And I'm doing something in Texas in a couple months. And I did something in, in Florida once. So I have spoken to them. And, you know, they, they love the Civil War in, in the South, too. Um, there are, they have a different way of thinking about it. And, and I mean, but there are a lot of, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to paint the entire region one way there there are angry people who wish the southern the, the south had won the civil war there are a lot of great americans in southern states who just love american history the way we all do and and those people are wonderful people and i've had many good conversations with with them too so so ted when you go uh, and do your your lecture in the south on your book do you have to change your your direction or your tone? Um, do you have to give more of a Southern aspect to it than, than you want to? I wouldn't say I change it a lot, but I might point out little nuances that they might appreciate, mm. including how slow Lincoln was to abolish slavery when he came in he really wanted to just keep everything intact. And that meant not ending slavery. And so I think they appreciate that he was, I mean, he was a Southerner himself. He's born in Kentucky and he had many Southern friends and he's really a unionist. He's not a Northerner. He's someone who loves the entire country and wants to keep it a single country. And I think they like to hear that because they've, sometimes grown up hearing that he's a sort of tyrant who forced the South into submission. And it's, it's way more complicated than that. Did you find any surprises when you were doing all this research about Lincoln, Lincoln the man? Um, did you find out anything new that possibly you, any angles that you, you were surprised to find that you weren't looking for? Well, earlier in his life, he's got a pretty big depressive side to his personality. He has some manic depressive episodes when he's a young man that are surprising and, and um, sort of disturbing. And he, he fell apart a couple of times as a young man and his friends were very worried about him, but he, he conquered those demons and, and, was fine by the time he was president, but he still was moody. People would talk about how he would look very um, sad one moment and then tell a joke and his face would light up, but he there was something unusual going on in, in his mood swings. To ask, what was the um, extent of his uh, servitude to his father? Because I guess that had an effect on him, understanding how life was for enslaved persons. Yeah, he, he had to do labor for his father the way most young men did. And there's some evidence that they irritated each other. Lincoln loved to read books. And if his father caught him reading a book while he was supposed to be doing manual labor on a farm, he would not be very happy. There's, there's actually evidence on both sides. There's some evidence that that wasn't true, that his father did everything he could to help Lincoln read the books that he loved. But some cousins said, no, there were times his father got really upset because it was like Lincoln didn't work hard enough. He just wanted to be educating himself. 
I appreciate your comments about the the South, and I was talking to uh, to Sarah last week about the irony that Daniel Webster uh, appears to be the first person to talk about a peaceable secession, um, and That's I great. wonder if 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 if, if that irony of of uh, you know Daniel Webster and then the Massachusetts Sixth and then uh, Calhoun being there and then everybody switching places and that it it really is this interfamily discussion people switching sides depending upon the decade. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in 1814, Massachusetts is really unhappy with the War of 1812, which is destroying northern shipping, so the whole northern economy is falling apart because of a war that's a very unclear war why we're fighting it. And it seems to be sort of run by Southern politicians, including James Madison as president. And so there's a convention of concerned New Englanders at Hartford, Connecticut, that I think Webster either went to or somehow expressed sympathy with, which later was complicated for him because his whole reputation later is he's a great unionist, but he'd actually been pretty close to su supporting this meeting in Hartford, which was there to discuss possibly pulling New England out of the United States because they were so upset about the War of 1812. So you're, it's a great question. The North flirts with some of the same ideas, but ultimately the North pulls back and, and doesn't do it. And and Northerners do fight for the U.S. in, in the War of 1812. Um, the U.S. Navy, which is mostly Northerners, does very well against the British and, and the Great Lakes and other places. The USS Constitution, which we all know is famous from the War of 1812. So, um, so the North gets kind of close, but doesn't quite cross over, whereas the South really does. And one thing I've thought about is the poor South was badly led, that the, the movement towards secession was kind of led by a cabal of senators who were unhappy and wanted to start their own country. They had a lot of seniority, they had a lot of arrogance, and they just dragged their states into this new government without really offering very many plebiscites. I mean, it's a pretty important decision and you'd think you would offer a vote to the people of your Southern state. And that almost, I think Texas maybe had one. I don't think any other Southern state had a chance to actually vote on secession. And, and so I feel like there was a kind of anti-democratic thing happening. It was a little cabal of people at the top of Southern politics who just were doing this without really giving rank and file Southerners. I mean, of course, African-Americans don't have the vote, so they're, they're not consulted, but a lot of poor whites who did the brunt of the fighting, they weren't consulted very much either. And it was just, you know, devastating for them. And so this was not a triumph of democracy. And a, a lot of later historiography said the South just wanted to go its own way and the North wouldn't let it. And that was anti-democratic, but in fact, the whole cause was anti-democratic by not really checking with Southern people very much. Mm -hmm. So how would you say that the, um, the newspapers that, that covered Lincoln on the trip, you know, you should talk about how he evolved. Did their, did their coverage um, evolve, uh, you know, those that were speaking to a Southern audience versus the Northern audience? Um, and then I think that played into, as you said, you know, the, uh, the, the successful secession movement? Well, he had a lot of pro and con uh, writing about him. And the papers that liked him already liked him before the train started. And then the ones that hated him, hated, I mean, there were a lot of Northern papers that really disliked Abraham Lincoln. There were Democratic Party papers and they were mad at Lincoln for winning. Um, but I do think there was an uptick over the course of the two weeks that after seeing him, people always, well, I shouldn't say always, but mostly came away pretty impressed that he wasn't as, 
I mean, a lot of it was about his physical appearance. And so I read a lot of articles that said he was not as ugly as we had been told. <laughs> he could actually speak a full sentence. He'd been told he was a kind of, kind of ignoramus and he isn't. And so just standing up and letting himself be seen and giving a short speech, he did a lot of good for his own cause. Mm -hmm. And he was really, it, he was really interested in history. And I think that self-educated part of him made him a great, a great man eventually because of his interest. And he couldn't, it seemed like he just could not get enough of information. That's right. He was reading all the time, self-taught, um, read newspapers, read books, um, he read about science and math in addition to history and politics. He loved a Greek mathematician named Euclid, surprisingly. So yeah, he was a very wide and eclectic reader. Did he read Homer? I found a couple places that said he did. Okay. So, yeah, I was happy to see that. How did you make that connection? That It was very interesting in the beginning of all your chapters. Did that just sort of fall into place? Just fell into place. And then once I did one or two, I, I made an effort to keep finding other passages that fit that, that chapter. Um, but I, I like Homer and I thought this is a kind of odyssey. It's a long trip in which the person is growing. And it's a kind of odyssey to save his country, which you feel like is also true in the Iliad and the Odyssey that something, it's just one person, but you feel like that one person is trying to save his entire country as, he, mm. as he's going from one place to the next. Good point. Any other comments, questions? Kathy, do you have your hand up over there? I do. I just wanted to say, as you were describing some of the resistance of the South to the, um, to the North and their issues, I was sort of thinking I heard a, a a thing on the radio today, a report about um, trying to convince these people to um, get their vaccinations. And it was sort of the same issue, the Eastern coast, you know, they yep. didn't trust the government. I thought it's the same thing. Yeah, it, it's, when I started this book in 2011, it just felt like a history book. And then as I got closer to 2020, it felt more like had uh, some current events in there too. <laughs> what was it like, just to get off the subject, what was it like working for President Clinton? It was thrilling. I, I was only a speechwriter, you know, that's kind of a low ranking office, but it was really exciting to be in the White House or I, I actually worked in the next building over, but um, it was really fun. It, uh, I did it for almost four years, enjoyed every day of it. But I, I knew I wasn't really, I mean, I, I like history so much, I wanted to get back into the teaching and writing of history, but I, I enjoyed every day I did it. Susan, did you have a question? For well, me? No, did Susan, Susan, did you, Purcell, did you have your hand up before? No. Oh. No? no? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Not everyone here knows that I'm related to the Purcells and to the buyers on this call, and to <laughs> mysterious Ellen Widmer, who hasn't shown her face, but she is actually my mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Come on, Ellen, show us your face. We want to see you. <laughs> we don't know if her, she's here. Maybe she just <laughs> walked away. Maybe it was boring to her. And she <laughs> 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 Oh, it is not. Oh, it's it. it no, there, there you are. There you are. Welcome, mom. Yeah, I've listened to every word. Thank you. <laughs> you should be so proud. Yes, I'm very proud. Very. I thought the. Wait a minute. Sorry, I have to put these on my my uh, voice doesn't come through well. But um, I I I must have read the book. Uh, I don't know what a year or more ago. I thought it came newly to life listening to Ted talk about it tonight, and through the questions that the uh, 
the audience asked, it, it was really fun to hear it again and then to see the pictures again. And I had forgotten completely about Homer until you brought it up. So, I mean, I learned a lot from listening tonight. Okay. Yeah, the questions were wonderful. Oh, we're happy to have you. Yeah, thank you. There's so many angles you could explore with this book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great discussion. And I have to apologize. I have a wonderful couch that I like to lie on and just listen. To, I, can, I, I, don't, you know, I, I don't have to say anything. I just, I really get it better if I don't even think of myself as talking. So that was what was going on. But okay. I didn't mean to be rude. So. No. no you're no problem. Yeah. We just wanted to, we wanted to see your smiling face. Well, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Excellent. Is is Margie still here, my sister? I am. Yep. yep. Rex there. Hi, oh, Rex. hi. So they're they're off in Seattle. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. So there, so there are some good things coming out of the pandemic. <laughs> we're, getting, <laughs> we're getting families together. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Virtually, yeah. It's been yeah. so nice to have authors from from all over. That well, you're not that far away, but uh, I think we only did virtual author talks once or twice before last year. Right. Now, yeah. I heard there was um, a, um, a small museum, if you will, um, here in Massachusetts, where a woman uh, in the, the mid 1800s, or I should say a little bit later, collected and collected and collected um, items that belonged to Lincoln. And so the family built a small uh, building behind the house. I think it's somewhere. It's one of the towns. It's in Milton. The, yes. It's in Milton. I would love, yeah. right. Oh. Have you heard of that? Um, oh. Yeah, we've been, we've been there and I've, I'm, I'm trying mightily to think of the name. Marjorie, do you remember the name of the house? I know I'm trying myself. I read about it. Um, so she, she collected and collected. And so here in Massachusetts, there's this place that has all these items that belong to Lincoln or yeah, some. Um, uh, it's the, the house uh, is mainly about the China trade, but, uh, yeah. but one of the family members did collect everything. And on um, Lincoln's birthday every year, she would open up the replica of his log cabin, which she had filled with all these things. Now, most of the stuff is in the house itself but they still have the replica log cabin out there. Wow. <laughs> See that. Is so it the Museum of the China Trade? No, That's it's in Hilton. Uh, there should be another name with Forbes it. House Museum. Okay. Yeah. Is, it, is it the Forbes House Museum? Forbes, that's Forbes. it. Yes, it is. That's yes, it, it is. Yes. Okay, okay. Sean, you get the prize. Yes, it's the Forbes House Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Ted, thank you so much for yes, joining us. Yes, yes. Thank and you very much. Let us know if you have a new project. Keep uh, keep us, okay, keep us in mind. And yeah. thank your family for joining us as well. Yeah, yeah. thanks everybody. Thank Sue, uh, back to you. And Sarah, thank you. Yep. And thank you for your wonderful photos. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I love all the comments about how um, people have learned a lot. I did as well. And we always enjoy that aspect of reading someone's book. So we thank you so much. Um, I want to remind everyone of our next session, which is uh, the book Stolen. Um, and that is by Richard Bell. And uh, Joan has been able to get him to come as well. Wow. She's done a, she's done a, a clean sweep, I think, this year with getting authors to come and hey. be with us. <laughs> I do want to emphasize that that session will be on January 18th. Um, early on in the process, we had set aside January 11th for the session, but it is, it, it's actually going to be on the 18th. So when you're filling out your spiffy new calendars, make sure you write it down for the 18th. Um, and we will see you at that time. In the meantime, everyone enjoy your holidays. Have a happy new year, and we'll see you in 2022. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much. You, really enjoyed yeah. it. Take care of you for a second time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.